I want to just give you a couple, three, four minutes on some thoughts I've had around the new way of launching companies. And it's nothing radically different, but there's some subtleties here that I think are interesting to kind of kind of talk about. And then we can get into whatever you guys want to get into. It doesn't matter. Um, Not all day. No, we don't. <laughs> there we but, go. Yeah. And I am a Cubs fan. How many Cubs fans do we have in the audience? All right. Go Cubs. There we go. How many Sox fans? That's good. It's a good crowd. All right. <laughs> We're on the north side. So. All right. Anyways, so a lot of you guys know all this stuff, but it's – fairly interesting to me how in the last seven years um, launching a product has evolved and evolved incredibly quickly here. Um, when, launch po when Oddpost was launched back in 2003, um, the way that you went about doing that was you either raised venture capital money and you had money to hire a PR agent or you networked like heck for a long period of time. And you might eventually get an article or get in front of somebody of note that would write about you, you know, after six, seven, eight months. And in the case of Oddpost, we actually even bought time on stage um, to um, at demo conference, and uh, paid fifteen thousand dollars, I think Ethan and Ian did in the day, in order to get access to journalists, right? That would write about your company. So, you know, we kind of fast forward in two thousand and four and oh five, we started seeing blogs come to life and people to having kind of this self. Um, publishing platform and where they can amplify a message. And when we were launching Sphere, because I was also getting involved with Word WordPress at the time, I thought, well, heck, instead of going to the traditional journalists, let's just go through the blogs. And this is in a time era when Mike Arrington had 12 people showing up at his house for his parties. So it was not at all popular, but it proved to be a really smart way to get the word out there because it reached a very distinct audience a bit of an echo chamber, but there's nothing wrong with building your product in the beginning around an echo chamber. And, you know, so we went to Mike and we got him to write about it. We got Giga Ohm, Ohm Malik to write about it, and a bunch of other people. And the other thing that we did was we actually got them to adopt our product. And this is the thing that was lost on me until just recently. You know, that's a very big difference, right? It's one thing to get somebody to write about you, but it's another to get them to actually integrate your product in. So when they're writing about you, it actually takes on even more meaning, more substance. So, you know, these guys became incredibly important. But at the tail end of that, I had something happen on Sphere that I thought was really interesting. Matt Mullenweg wrote kind of a two-sentence thing, Sphere is cool, check it out. And it had as much impact on our business as a TechCrunch article did at the time. And it was kind of the first little glimpse, and this is probably 06, end of 06, into the power of the social graph and you know, just being associated with somebody that people respected. So all of a sudden we saw a ton of interest. So as we thought about about.me, we thought, okay, so who are those people that we want to go out and reach? And actually our focus has been going out to individuals, not their blogs, but going out to people that have massive presence in the social graph and talking to them and doing the same thing that we did with Sphere, which is let's not just get those people to amplify the messages that are out there or the message that we have, but let's also get a handful of those people, in our case 25 advisors, all right, for a team of four full-time people that's now grown to a team of eight people, right, but 25 advisors who are people that we want to be strongly associated with and we want to have associated with our project. So I think as you're thinking through launching a product and service today, I think you really have to think about who's your entourage, right? Who's your posse? Who are you going to bring with you as you kind of go out there and launch into the marketplace? It's incredibly helpful to have these people on our team. So native, I picked Dick because he's a native Chicagoan, um, but uh, he's certainly a great one for us to have on our team. So that's it. All right, so we're, we're going to do something, some, some questions here for myself, and then we're going to open it up uh, to the audience questions. So get your questions ready. Um, actually, we first met actually on a phone call. I was actually at the time writing for TechCrunch, and I was writing an article about Sphere back in 2006. And uh, actually, never, that article never actually got published, but that's how we met. And then when I went to AOL, my first day at AOL in 2006, um, Tony was there to greet me on, on my first day. So we actually just had a reunion in the back here. Jen was there as well. So that was one of my first lunch, you know, lunch. Actually, I never, 
because of that, I never actually got to, to learn anything about the programs that AOL offered. We actually just went to lunch. So I missed out on all the, uh, I have no idea what any of the 401k setup was or anything like that, but it was worth it because it was, it was a good lunch. It was just lunch. But I uh, wanted to talk about your, your, you're in a really interesting, interesting position. Like you're, you're, you're obviously investing in all these different companies and you're doing the entrepreneur thing yourself. So kind of, you know, how do you do that? <laughs> <laughs> you should ask my wife. Um, <laughs> You know, it's, it's, it's a little bit of a different model, and it's one that we've yeah. been doing since the beginning of True Ventures. So one of the cool things about True Ventures, uh, and John Callahan, Phil Black, John Burke, who uh, were pulling together the fund, and when they approached Tony Schneider, who's CEO of WordPress, and myself about also being included in the fund, um, you know, it, in the beginning it was a bit of a project, so sure, let's do it. These are our buddies, of course we want to do a fund. Yeah. And in the time period of raising that fund, a couple of companies were born. One was Sphere and the other one was WordPress, which Tony subsequently became CEO of. So it kind of presented a question mm -hmm. as we were closing the fund, you know, how do we do both? And I think, at least in my case, I can't speak for Tony, but I thought, I thought you know, I'd do it for a while and then hire a CEO and, and treat it like an investment, if you want. Um, True was the lead investor in the company. Right. And um, so it kind of happened organically, mm -hmm. um, where they all grew up at the same time, kind of the same pace. Right. Um, so I think what's interesting now with About.me, and I was contemplating, do I want to start another company or just want to go back to full-time investing um, with a fairly large portfolio? You know, I couldn't help myself, and I'm just too indulgent. So I just said, yeah, I'm going to start another company. I got this idea. I think it's interesting. I'm going to go for it, and let's see how it goes. You know, what I was a little surprised about is how quickly About.me has scaled. Um, and I don't think we were ready for the initial kind of reception of it. So, um, you know, how do, we, how do we turn that to our advantage with our portfolio, right. or the portfolio that I work with, so you I do, you leverage part. some of that, the portfolio, right? So Totally. So yeah. Kissmetrics, one right. of my portfolio companies, uh, Heaton Shaw is an advisor. And integrating Kissmetrics in from the beginning is something that's very smart. Um, and we do that you know, with Typekit, one of, um, one of our investments where I sit on the board of. Uh, we've integrated Typekit throughout our product. Mm -hmm. So you know, it's great to be both a kind of a partner yeah. as well as an investor and, and you're somebody who has different insight. Basically, I mean, to, to do this... Uh, you know, you've got all these different investments and you're working with them. So what's your most interesting investment among, <laughs> among the portfolio? There is no most interesting. I okay. could leave everyone off. It's, uh, it's uh, app savvy since uh, Michael Burke is There he is here. in the back. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, I think WordPress, you know, is, is really kind of the first one. Mm -hmm. And obviously WordPress has um, become a very important kind of business in the right. tech world. It's, uh, I don't know if you guys know this, but about 10%, a little bit under 10%, of the web runs on WordPress. That's huge. Wow. Uh, it's an order of magnitude different from anyone else. So mm -hmm. that kind of scale presents lots of interesting insight and, and, uh, and opportunities. That's right. fun. Right. Okay, so let's talk about some of your past companies. So you had, you were a uh, board member at, at Oddpost, and you sold to Yahoo, so you, you worked with Yahoo, and then you, you know, your other company, Sphere, you ended up working with AOL and then sold to AOL. Can you kind of talk about the strategy there and how, you know, as, a, as an entrepreneur, you know, working with these bigger companies has been in kind of a, a kind of more like a strategy for, for doing that and how it's obviously it's paid off for you. Is that something you'd advise? Or? Yeah, I think um, I say this a lot to our portfolio companies. Uh, the good ones always have options yeah. to sell and they have to decide what they really want to do. Mm -hmm. So eBay had options to sell. Um, Yahoo had options to sell. Google right. probably had options to sell. So, you know, and there's a lot of companies that make the wrong decision there, and we can't remember their names. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a careful decision when that acquisition offer right. comes. And I think, you know, the case of Oddpost, um, we had a group of people that were um, what I'll call early in their entrepreneurial career right. and had not you know, had the validation that comes with an exit. And so it made sense in that particular case to exit to Yahoo, but it particularly made sense to sell to Yahoo because it's the largest web mail right. company. So if you in don't know Oddpost, it, it's actually the Ajax mail, right? That, That's that right. That ended up coming, turning into Yahoo mail. Bingo. Right. And so it made sense. Massive footprint to go play in. And I think it's worked out incredibly well for right. Oddpost. Mm -hmm. um, in the case of Sphere, we looked at it and felt like AOL 
when they made us the offer, um, was the perfect partner because they had a huge amount of content and our product was dependent on running on content. Right. And we felt like we could just scale from that platform much better and that's worked out incredibly well as, right. as well. Uh, in the case of WordPress, yes, there's been options to take it off the table early on, right. but it didn't feel like that was the right decision, right? We could never add it up and say that makes sense for both the entrepreneur as well as the product footprint, felt like it should be its own independent company. And Matt, mm -hmm. you know, uniquely made that decision. He made the right decision. One of the things that I, I think you do really well, and I've seen you do it a couple times now, is distribute your products. And then you talked about it a little bit here and how it's changing. Can you talk a little bit more about that and kind of your kind of strategic kind of plan for like, for example, Sphere? You, you distributed it everywhere. And, and how did you do that? Well. We did it without a business model. That's how we did it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I think I think there's an early part of your kind of formation where you got to yeah. figure out how to make some motion happen that equates to progress, mm -hmm. and uh, it doesn't necessarily have to wrap around a business model because that can add a lot of friction. Mm -hmm. So in our case, we wanted to get on as many sites as possible across the web. I think we reached our peak at about. 12 to 13 billion monthly article pages wow. that Sphere was integrated into. Um, it's still a very yeah. big number. I mean, but every, pretty much every major publication had the little Sphere logo on it. There you go. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we took all the friction out. I just went to people and just said, look, you know, you've got something that you need us to do. We'll crawl your content. We'll show related content from your archives. We'll help you make more money, more engagement, and mm -hmm. what's not to love about that formula? Right. Did there you sign deals of, with all of them, or did you? No. No, right. And so it's not get crazy. Right, I know. That's what I wanted <laughs> no, to bring up. No, yeah. But, you know, over time, we actually were doing money, right? We had yeah. partners uh, like the Wall Street Journal and mm -hmm. Time and uh, New York Times and CNN, and these kind of customers pay money. Yeah. And they were willing to pay money because they saw the footprint in the, in the traction. Mm -hmm. So they wanted to be a part of that kind of movement. That made a lot of sense for us there. Uh, in the case of About.me, we're already being approached by tons of companies wanting to do internal directories mm -hmm. and things like that. And I think we'll cherry pick a few of those projects that we think are interesting and we'll do them. And we'll probably do them at zero cost mm -hmm. to those partners because there's a quid pro quo in the beginning right. of helping us to get the exposure. Okay, so let's switch gears a little bit and talk about investing. And you tend to invest in really solid founders, that's just my own observation, uh, versus you know kind of trends. Is that what you actually do, or is that just the way it works out? Oh no, the founders are all crazy. <laughs> We're all crazy. Um, no, I. In fact, I'll go. Um, I'll go on a limb here and say that I only invest. Um, when I'm leading an investment yeah. on behalf of True, it almost always is wrapped around my belief in that individual right. and less about the space. Mm -hmm. um, it's so early. You know, we're doing the first money into a company almost across the board. Yeah. And so I'm making an instinctive bet on that individual. And what I look for, I do look for things, right? Yeah. I look for, um, try to understand what domain they're playing in. Mm -hmm. And then I try to look for unfair advantages that they might bring to the table because they're part of that domain. So I'll give you a good example of this, type kit. Right. Uh, Jeff Veen and Brian Mason. So Jeff Veen's one of the uh, co-founders of Adaptive Path, highly respected uh, UX firm and consultancy in San Francisco. The people that actually coined the phrase Ajax, and that's how I met him, because oh. Oddpost was, was, the, was the leading Ajax right. uh, company. And uh, so, you know, Jeff then started a company called MeasureMap, which evolved into Google Analytics. Mm -hmm. And then when he left, he wanted to do something in the font uh, arena. So had he wanted to do something either in analytics or font or design, mm -hmm. he has an unfair advantage. He's respected, he knows everybody, he can navigate very quickly. Right. So those are the kind of people that I like to back. Right. Um, occasionally those people come across you know, our table and we can't do it because we just don't have an appetite for another deal, timing's off, right. dynamics are wrong, whatever it is. So it's not, it's not if we turn somebody down, it's not because we don't believe like in them, them necessarily. Right. It's timing, right? The timing is a big deal Everything. here. Okay. Um, do you want to talk about anything else? Do you want to take questions? What do you feel like? Let's take questions. Let's questions. go out there into right. the wild. Yep. We got one in the front right here. So SEO questions. Yeah, will that be an SEO option later on that people can adjust? Absolutely. If I can 
Sure. So the question has to, well, there's two points. So, so far, about.me doesn't have video options. So are you going to offer video options? We're going to offer video options. Okay. And so secondly... Look for Vimeo, YouTube, and things like that to come soon. Second part of that question has to do with SEO. All the about.me pages start with about.me as the title, and it's not customizable. Is that what you're asking? Or? Okay. Yeah, so there's a lot of things on domain. So yeah. domain mapping, I think you're getting into in part and yeah. the about.me role. So um, we'll absolutely empower people that have their own domains to map those domains over. And we'll do the hosting for free and all that. Um, and that's a small percentage of people that, you know, both have their own kind of custom URL and actually understand how to do the domain mapping. It's, it's quite technical still. Um, you know, there's a second piece, which is the about.me URL in and of itself. And I do believe that part of the reason why we started this company was I noticed my behavior was I get introduced to Frank, and I don't know who Frank is, and it's an email. This happens all the time, numerous times per day. And I go and I Google Frank. Now, Frank's name may be unique enough, and he may have a big enough social presence that he'll pop up high, but in most cases, it doesn't work that way. Even my name, I'll be the last five results, right? So there's a musician who's more famous. Um, so it's, to me, it was, it was annoying, right, to be able to find those people. And so what happens after, after a little bit of time, I stopped searching in Google because I felt like it was dumpster diving for profiles. I started searching LinkedIn, you know, LinkedIn slash Frank Gruber. It was just a quicker shortcut to get there. So I think there is a convention in the world where if everybody has an about.me page, and I think everybody should have their own web page, a very simple web page, um, I can imagine a search convention that, that comes with that. So about.me in your name. Um, if you just go, you guys can do this. I haven't done it in weeks. But uh, if you just go search on the words about, no dot, but just about and me, we'll come up number one already. And we're still in private beta. That's a pretty big deal given that those words are on almost every website across the web. Question in the front here, Swathi. Um, so you were talking about investing in founders who have an unfair advantage. And so I was guessing, what advice would you have for first-time entrepreneurs? First-time entrepreneurial advice. Yeah. Well, we definitely have backed. I mean, Matt Mullenweg was a first-time entrepreneur, um, but he clearly lived and breathed you know, the, the domain. I think getting people, I think everybody can get access to people if they network hard enough and getting those people to be around the table and just for them to say yes, they believe in you, they believe in the project, they're willing to be associated with it, I think that's a huge plus, right? And it's also the best way to reach people like Brad or Fred Wilson or myself or, or whatnot is that, you know, as you can imagine, there's a lot of kind of unsolicited inbound and that goes nowhere. I, I've never done one of those deals. I can't speak for them, but I, I highly doubt any of us have ever done one of those deals. Um, getting referred in to someone, you know, that's probably, you know, who is associated with your project is the best way to get to us. Always. Next question. There's one right here. Educational scope? I'm not sure it does. Yeah, I'm not, sure, <laughs> I'm not that. sure that's the problem we set out to solve. Um, the thing I do think that's cool about it, that's, um, I'll say, on the periphery of that, is um, self-esteem. And one of the beautiful things about the prod product so far is the way that people are deploying it. And they're using big photos of themselves. Lots of beautiful people and lots of not so beautiful people, but lots of people putting photos of themselves. And I think it's, it's actually quite nice to see, right? It's just people being proud, right, of who they are and what they do and willing to put it out there. So I thought when we set up the product, um, we actually have some art backgrounds that I thought half the people would adopt because they wouldn't be comfortable putting that photo up. And uh, it turns out that almost everybody just puts a photo. I know you're laughing, but that's as close as I can come to education on that one. <laughs> Front row here. Oh, we we pass through the copyright on the photo. So if somebody violates it, then all it needs to be, I mean, we can't police everything, right? But when digital assets come through, they should come through with the photo, you know, for, with the accreditation, the copyright. So we're doing this, this is a big issue for one of our partners, Simon & Schuster, 
Um, so there is the photograph of the author, there's the book cover, jacket cover. These are all owned by different people, right? And so one of the things we've had to be very careful about is identifying that, grabbing it, putting in the text automatically. You're welcome. I'm sure we'll screw it up a lot. <laughs> So what, what problems are people solving that you're excited about? Yeah, so there's a, couple, um, there's a couple themes that I'm really interested in. One is personal analytics. I think that part of our About Me project touches on that, but not fully. Um, I think people, because of their social media presence, increasingly kind of want to be able to hold a mirror up and understand maybe how that reflects back on them and have a set of tools to manage that. So if you're an entrepreneur, I'd say go, go, go build that. I think it's hugely important. Um, the other area is in the enterprise, right? And it's the movement of these kind of social graph tools into the enterprise, um, I think is very interesting. We're seeing a lot, of, uh, a lot of deals coming around that. Then there's HTML5 and there's a lot of technical, technology-driven ideas, but I'm less, you know, that's less me. I'm more, I'm more about the uh, consumer. I've got a question. Yeah. So you still are, are working with AOL. You're a special advisor to AOL Ventures as well, and I forgot to mention that before. Can you talk about that relationship a little bit more? Yeah. So um, I think if you're ever so fortunate uh, to start a company and have it acquired, um, it, it is an amazing gift, right? So it is both economically, uh, typically it's economically very rewarding, but just for your own kind of self-esteem and your validation in the community is huge. And when that happens, you know, when first time it happened for me, it was like, yeah, I watched my bank account swell, and I was like, wow, that is great, you know. But that, honestly, it was like the feeling I had, like when I went out to the parties that next week and made the circuit, it was like, wow, that was like so much more powerful than anything I ever imagined. And I thought I would have just done it just for that. I really would have. Um, the affirmation was incredible. Um, so I think if you're so fortunate to be in that position, when you leave a company, uh, you should do it respectfully. Um, even if it has not turned out, and this is a little controversial, right? I think a lot of big companies acquire smaller companies and they mess them up. Right? They, they kill the culture, they get them off task, they whatever. Um, and I understand the temptation to you know, flip them off on the way out the door, and I've watched a number of entrepreneurs do that. Anybody you know? I'm not going <laughs> to, I won't go there. Um, but I think that's a huge mistake. People have long memories, and I think it's a bad business decision. And so in the case of AOL, not only did I have, because we had a little leverage in the process because we had competing big firms uh, that wanted to buy our company, um, we had no lockup, meaning we sold them the business I could have left the day after. And I know enough not to do that. So I stayed 18 months, because 18 months is the number I feel is like the right amount of time. Um, when I was leaving, Tim Armstrong um, was just joining. And he said, dude, you know, like, you're the kind of guy that we need around here. And I said, yeah, but I'm not that kind of guy. Um, but he said, well, how do we figure out a way to keep you involved? Are you sure there's nothing we can do? And he came back with this idea of me being a special advisor uh, to AOL, and I graciously accepted. I mean, like, why wouldn't I? You know, I believe in him. I'm excited about what he's doing. I think he has a hard job. I think AOL has an incredibly hard job. Um, but it's exciting to be around the table, and, you know, they're good people, so why wouldn't I want to be associated with it? That's great. Hey, Frank. Yeah. Yeah. Tony, uh, people tell me all the time what a dunderhead I am, and everybody knows I don't know anything about computers. So I fit right in with AOL. They see it as being basically a trip back to uh, Neanderthal times. What, what's your answer to that? Is AOL, and, and while you're answering that, can you explain to me from your point of view why AOL, which is viewed as a somewhat retro company, uh, bought tech? Well, let's go with the last, yeah. and then we'll go with the first. Yeah. Um, well, actually, I'll go with the first. You know what? If you're comfortable and you like AOML, why change? I, I, you know what I mean? I mean, honestly, if you like AIM and you know how it works and you're comfortable working with those products, even if it's dial-up, 
Why, why, why change? I know. Well, I, you know, but I, don't, but I don't use Yahoo Mail and I don't use Gmail because I'm trying to be cool. I use it because it has it utility to me. It works and I'm comfortable with it. So the switching costs for me in that are exceptionally high, just as they would be exceptionally high even though I took a dig at Google, right? Google works for me across the board for the rest of the things I'm trying to you know, kind of research, right? So I use it systematically. The switching costs are incredibly high. I think for you, um, you know, Ron, I think, you know, it works for you. Keep, just use it. How do I know? Because I, you, I know who you are. I've seen you before. <laughs> Come on, man. Everybody knows who you are. <laughs> All right. The TechCrunch piece. See, so I, I get asked that question a lot. And, uh, and uh, I think it was a brilliant acquisition, and I think Mike made a great decision if he wanted to sell his business. That's his decision, right? Um, I'm not so sure I would have sold TechCrunch then, because I think it has a lot of momentum, but that was the decision he wanted to make. So AOL bought Weblogs, Jason Kalkanis' company, um, and took Weblogs and has leveraged it throughout um, AOL as the way that their content sites should run. So it's a very little known fact that AOL is, if not the largest, Biggest, probably yeah. the second or third largest content um, producer on the web, right? A huge number of sites. Nobody knows that AOL and Time Warner did TMZ.com together, right. billion page view site in less than four years. So what they did with weblogs, I thought was great because those businesses not only you know, work better, they thrived. I mean, in a big way, right? So they have grown exponentially, I don't know, tenfold, and their revenues are, ex you know, are growing and, and more important. And what it's done is it's impacted the way the other content groups at AOL think, right? So AOL Sports all of a sudden rebranded itself as Fan House and was one of the earlier companies in the traditional media space to integrate comment streams and interactivity within the content, right? You see that happening in AOL News. You see that happening in Daily Finance. So I think it's had a huge impact, and I think TechCrunch um, made a smart move, right? It's a huge platform for them to grow from. Secondly, I think that AOL learned a lot. At least that division within AOL learned a lot about how do you acquire a company that has somewhat a virtual existence, which a lot of these you know, micro-publishing formats do, and how do you integrate them into the company? and how you integrate them in a way that makes sense for them. So I'm sure there'll be growing pains for TechCrunch. Um, there's always the HR people to deal with at AOL. But beyond that, I'm, um, I'm also sure that it will thrive. It will do very, very well. That's a great answer. Um, looking at weblogs and the way they integrated that and really have grown, I mean, I think they see that as the kind of way to the, way of the future. And it actually, you know, obviously built, you know, buying TechCrunch adds additional you know, cachet to what AOL is trying to do on the content side. Yeah, I think it's a good move. Yep. All right, any other questions here? Come on, don't be shy. Oh, here we go. Gloria. Uh, you mentioned AOL, so they've just uh, been launching out Patch.com. Patch. Talk about Patch. No comment on Patch. Okay. Um, you know, I'll I just be, I'll be frank. I mean, I know a little bit about it. Um, John Broad is somebody that I work with incredibly closely. He was the founder, CEO of Patch. Um, but, you know, I'm not so in tune with that product. I'm not using it mm -hmm. at this stage. I, I, I know what it is, but I just, I don't have an opinion on it. Mm -hmm. I think local is interesting. I think it's a big challenge. It might be fool's mm -hmm. gold. Mm -hmm. I like the name. Um, question over here. Well, yeah. <laughs> the question is, can relationships go bad if you've got a website, like if you leverage third-party services like Get Satisfaction or some of these other products that are out there? Yeah, I think we're, we're kind of over some of the technical hurdles that were awkward in the early days. I go back to Sphere. We were one of the first kind of third-party applications running across um, uh, you know, a bunch of number of websites, and so we would crash, and we weren't integrated in a way that you know, it wouldn't impact our partner site, so we had to build tools around that. And I think most people have gotten through that piece. 
Um, I think with any partner, you invest a lot. So if it gets satisfaction or user voice, um, you know, I think we use user voice on about.me. So we're investing a lot, right? We believe in that relationship. It's, it's going to be a bummer if user voice were to go out of business. I don't think it will. Don't start that rumor. <laughs> I wouldn't want to be associated with it. But um, it will be a bummer, you know, if they go out of business, you know. And if there's not another company like that to fill the void, then we've got to go figure it out. So that's, that's the, the risk with all these small kind of third-party companies like ours. How are we doing? Any more questions for Tony? I, I think we should have had you guys drink before. Yeah, now. maybe we should be at Tech Cocktail then if, if you guys... <laughs> no, uh, no final thoughts, questions, anything. Come on, one hard question. Jen in the oh, front Jen. Here. Yeah, trends of 2011. Well, I, I think I mentioned personal analytics and the enterprise, but I think on the VC side and on the entrepreneur side, I think we're looking at um, some potential very difficult issues to s kind of navigate. So um, one of the things that Brad talked about and I've heard mentioned a few times is this movement towards um, converts which essentially is saying, I'm going to get your money now and I'm going to price it at a later date when there's more value. So essentially, I'm going to use your money, right? And I'm going to create more value. The issue is with that, just because you can get it, you know, my dad has this great saying, you know, you know be careful, you might get what you ask for. Right. Um, just because you can get it doesn't make it the right answer, right? Because the climate is so frothy, especially in the kind of angel, the early part of the funnel, so frothy that valuations can move very, very quickly, um, way ahead of themselves. And so that creates structural issues when you go to raise the next round. This happened in 99. We just saw it on a much larger scale, right? It was where companies were valued at $80 million and, you know, $15 million had gone in. And it was a good company. It was an interesting company. But there was no way anybody else would come and invest in it, right? Because it meant you essentially had to wash out the capital in front of you, which is ugly, has all kinds of implications for the founders and the rest of the team. So it's just a messy, messy environment. You go, ah, life is short. Let's go find something new. So I think, I think a lot of first-time entrepreneurs that have pursued this avenue, the ones that are really working are going to be thankful because they gave up less of their company for more money and they were in a position of leverage. But as we know, 95, 99% of the companies don't hit that, right? There's very few form springs out there or type kits or WordPresses. Um, and I think those companies are gonna have a hard time raising follow-on capital. And uh, that's gonna be a big issue in the coming year. So good time to start a company? Always a good time to start a company. Never, there's, there's, there's never, uh, it, like, if you try to time the market to start a company, you're, 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 you're crazy. You should just start a company when you want to start a company. Um, you should just structure it in a way that makes sense. You shouldn't overcapitalize. You should spend money very, very slowly until you have real proof of concept um, and traction. And only then, you know, take a calculated risk and capitalize in a bigger way and spend money more aggressively. But only then. I think that's a good... Uh a nice closing. Are there any other questions if there? I think that's it. Tony, it was a pleasure. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Frank. All the way out here.